Episode 13, Success Comes From Ideas. Would you call yourself a creative person? Today I'd like to talk with you about the characteristics of creative people. A study of leaders shows certain traits are always apparent in the creative person, and here's a list of them. Perhaps no person has them all, but the Edisons, Ketterings, the Bells, the Einsteins, and Shakespeare's, and the modern creative persons certainly have many of the following characteristics. Number one, drive, the desire to work hard and long. Two, courage, tenacity of purpose. Three, goals, the creative person knows what he wants and goes after his goals with vigor. Four, knowledge. He has an insatiable thirst for knowledge. He knows his subject. He does his homework. He constantly bones up on it. He vigorously seeks total knowledge in his subject area. Number five, good health. He keeps physically fit. Number six, optimism. The creative person is usually optimistic and positive. He believes in people. He tries hard to be part of the solution to a problem and not part of the problem. Number seven, enthusiasm. He's an enthusiastic person. He has a zest for life. He lives fully. Eight, honesty. He's frank, forthright, honorable. He has integrity, and he is, above all, intellectually honest. Nine, judgment. He has judgment. He searches for facts, evaluates them, tries to always understand first, then he judges. Ten, he's a chance taker. He doesn't fear failure. He knows failure is often a stepping stone to success. Eleven, enterprising. He courageously takes on jobs others don't want or jobs others have failed to accomplish. He's daring and bold. He doesn't try the impossible or ridiculous, but he's not afraid to try the unknown. He's an opportunity seeker. Twelve, he's outgoing. He makes friends easily. He encourages people and ideas to grow in his presence. Thirteen, he's dynamic, energetic, on the move. Fourteen, he's persuasive. He knows how to sell. Fifteen, he's articulate. He has verbal skill and competence. He uses active verbs and simple words. He's communicative. Sixteen, he's patient with others, impatient with himself. Seventeen, he's a perfectionist, always striving for excellence. He will not tolerate mediocrity, particularly in himself. Eighteen, he's sensitive. His gateways to the mind are always open. He's highly tuned to life around him. Nineteen, he's flexible. He's pliable and resilient, not rigid in his thinking. Twenty, he has a sense of humor. He laughs easily and enjoys a good story. Twenty-one, he's curious and inquisitive. He's forever asking why. Twenty-three, he's versatile. He does many things well. Twenty-four, he's individualistic, non-conforming, aggressive, fearless. And twenty-five, he's creative. He knows how to imagine, how to put combinations together and think in new terms. He thinks first and then judges his thoughts afterwards. That's the creative person. Well, how did you score as a creative person? Well, that's pretty good. 25 out of 25. That makes you about one in a million. You'll go far. We're all creative creatures. Each of us has been given unique gifts, and it has been written that to those who are given much, they must be willing to give much. But what comes first? Receiving or giving? As we enter the workforce, take on a new job or career, or go into a negotiation, there's always that tendency to ask, what's in it for me? What happens when a creative, competent person reverses that strategy and enters a relationship by thinking, what can I do for you? Or, what's in it for you? An interesting true story appeared in the magazine The American Salesman, and I'd like to pass it along to you. It'll show you the value of one good idea and what it can be worth. One day, an efficiency expert named Ivy Lee was interviewing Charles Schwab, president of Bethlehem Steel Company. Lee outlined his organization's service to Schwab and ended by saying, With our service, you'll know how to manage better. To which Schwab replied, I'm not managing as well now as I know how to. What we need is not more knowing, but more doing. Not knowledge, but action. If you can give us something to pep us up to do the things we already know we ought to do, I'll gladly listen to you and pay you anything within reason you ask. Fine, answered Lee. I can give you something in 20 minutes that'll step up your action and doing at least 50%. Schwab was interested, so Lee handed Schwab a blank note sheet from his pocket and said, Write on this paper the six most important tasks you have to do tomorrow. Now that took about three minutes. Now number them in order of their importance, he said. That took about five minutes. Then Lee said, Now put this paper in your pocket, and the first thing tomorrow morning look at item one and start working on it until it's finished. Then tackle number two in the same way, then item three and so on. Do this until quitting time. 
Don't be concerned if you've only finished one or two. You'll be working on the most important ones. The others can wait. If you can't finish them all by this method, you couldn't have with any other method either, and without some system, you'd probably not even have decided which was the most important. Do this every working day. After you've convinced yourself of the value of this system, have your men try it. Try it as long as you wish, and then send me a check for what you think it was worth. The whole interview between Lee and Schwab lasted about 20 or 30 minutes. In a few weeks, Schwab sent Lee a check for $25,000 with a letter saying the lesson was the most profitable from a money standpoint that he had ever learned. In five years, using this plan, it was largely responsible, they claim, for turning the, at that time, unknown Bethlehem Steel Company into the biggest independent steel producer in the world, and it helped to make Charlie Schwab a hundred million dollars and the best-known steel man in the world. Well, that's the story of the man who made $25,000 in about 30 minutes with a single great idea, and that was in the days when $25,000 was a fortune and you could keep all of it. Of course, the reason I've told you the story is twofold. One, since it works so well for Charles Schwab, you might want to try the same thing yourself. You'll be pleasantly surprised at the number of things you will accomplish, and in far less time, simply by tackling them one at a time and in the order of their importance. And two, it goes a long way to show the value of an idea, an idea for improving a given situation. Ideas are, always have been, always will be, the most valuable things on earth. As Phelps put it, a great idea is usually original to more than one discoverer. Great ideas come when the world needs them. They surround the world's ignorance and press for admission. Metaphors like the rain falls on everyone or the sun shines on everyone have been used to illustrate that good ideas come in droves from the universe and one who acts on them becomes successful and others do not. Most people who've had success will run into people who will say, that was my idea. The difference is that the person with competence acted on the idea. They took the risk. The spectators who claim it was their idea, they too are not wrong. They most likely did get the same inspiration. They just didn't take the next step. Here's another metaphor. Opportunities are like time. Opportunities never stop and the clock ticks for everyone the same. When you receive that spark of an idea, the key to success is not to underestimate yourself. A woman asked me this question. Isn't it better, Mr. Nightingale, for a person to realize his limitations? Well, I answered that I thought it fine for a person to realize his limitations, if he knows what they are. Each of us knows that there are lots of fields in which we have little or no ability. But we should realize at the same time that there are fields in which we have not reached the limits of our ability, fields in which we will never reach the limits of our ability. The trouble with most people seems to be that they have a dwarfed and limited picture of themselves in their own minds, and as a result, never really know what their true abilities are. We marvel at the electronic brains man has invented and now uses in hundreds, thousands of applications, problem-solving machines, guided missiles with built-in guidance systems that can cause them to dive into the middle of a small target thousands of miles away. These electronic creatures of man's mind and imagination have built in success mechanisms. Once given a target, they'll successfully accomplish their missions. Well, the human brain is similar, but a million times more complex, more miraculous, and more efficient than the finest electronic device, or all of them put together. So then, how can a person recognize his limitations? when he will never, during his entire life, learn to utilize all of his potential. If more people knew and understand that they have enormous possibilities that they habitually fail to use, or even know they have, they'd do a lot more living. They'd know more, do more, have more in five years' time than they'd otherwise accomplish in a lifetime. The more I study this subject, the more the real experts in the field uncover, the more convinced I become that a successful life can belong to anyone who makes the attempt to explore his own deep reservoirs of talent and generally unused ability. Examining one's own limitations can lead to understanding of yourself, and that leads to a question. How do you make a man bigger? Of course, you can't make him bigger than he is, although in the years ahead he can become a lot bigger than he is today, but you can make him a lot bigger than he thinks he is. Now, psychologists have long deplored the tragic loss to the community and the nation, and particularly to the individuals involved,
caused by the fact that at least three out of four persons underestimate themselves in the areas of energy, ability, talent, and brains. Now, that's at least three out of four. The figure's probably a lot closer to nine out of ten. But why do people underestimate themselves and, by doing so, miss out on the abundance they could know as a result of the greater contribution they could be making? I think they do this because of the simple fact that we tend to discount the familiar. No man is a prophet in his own town, or a hero to his own family. The stranger riding into town of Western fiction is always held in more awe and interest. He looms larger than old Charlie the blacksmith who was born and raised there. But the fact of the matter is that the stranger, Charlie, and the onlookers are all capable of greater effort and interest, if they're given a big enough reason. Now, it's a fact that each of us has deep reservoirs of ability that we habitually fail to use. Now, why don't we use these great areas of sheer net profit for ourselves and the community? Well, I think there are four reasons. They're not good reasons, but they're reasons all the same. Number one, we don't have to. Number two, we're doing about as well as the next guy. Number three, we're using averages as standards of satisfactory performance. And four, we don't know we have so much reserve power and ability. We take ourselves for granted while we give all kinds of credit to other people. Now, where we make our greatest mistake is in failing to realize the entirely new worlds of gratification, service, and reward that could be ours, that would be ours, if we live more fully extended, closer to our potential. The tired old refrain we hear on every side is, why should I knock myself out? While the matter of the fact is that we wouldn't knock ourselves out at all. On the contrary, we'd find, perhaps for the first time, the great new world of mental and physical second wind that would lead us to goals we hardly dared to dream of working, as most of us do in second gear. We do what we want to do, in many cases what we feel we have to do in order to slip by, but nothing more. We give an inch when we could be giving a mile, and then wonder why we travel by inches instead of by miles. You make a man bigger, I think, by holding up a better mirror, a truer mirror that shows him what he really is or could be, that makes him see humanity for what it really is, a kind of convoy moving at a slow speed so as to protect its slowest member. He should know that as an individual he can break loose from the convoy and chart his own course and travel at his own speed. Here's a question everyone should ask himself from time to time. Where will I be, what kind of person will I be, five years from now, if I keep going the same way I have the past five? What's your answer? Will you really need the next five years to achieve what you want? How do you know when you've reached that point where you've exhausted all of your efforts and time has run out? Is there a time to give up and move on? Genius is only the power of making continuous efforts. The line between failure and success is so fine that we scarcely know when we pass it, so fine that we're often on the line and don't know it. How many a man has thrown up his hands at a time when a little more effort, a little more patience, would have achieved success? As the tide goes clear out, so it comes clear in. In business sometimes, prospects may seem darkest when really they're on the turn. A little more persistence, a little more effort, or and what seemed hopeless failure may turn to glorious success. There is no failure except in no longer trying. There is no defeat except from within. No really unsurmountable barrier save our own inherent weakness of purpose. Well, that's the way it goes. I know a very successful businessman who told me that the first few years of trying to operate his business were so trying, so discouraging, that he could hardly drag himself out of bed in the morning to open up again. He told me that as he'd put the key in the door of his place of business, he'd think to himself, once more, I'll open the door once more. Maybe today will be the day. He was overwhelmed by debts. His friends told him to quit, and he was sick at heart. But every morning he'd open that door just one more time. After things got so black that he was on the brink of ruin, he just kept opening the door. And one morning, the idea came to him that started the pendulum swinging in the other direction. It was slow and painful, but he'd made the turn and was on the home stretch at last. In a year or so, he was even again, and from then on, well, it was nothing but winning. We were on a fishing trip together, and he smiled and said, Sometimes I break out in a cold sweat thinking of what might have happened if I'd given up. Maybe on the very day I got the idea that saved me. People credited with all kinds of ability, talent, brains, and know-how, including the ability to see into the future, 
frequently have nothing more than the courage to keep everlastingly at what they set out to do. They have that one great quality that is worth more than all the rest put together. They simply will not give up. Nobody knows on what day the line of final success is crossed. This is why a person's decision at the beginning of an undertaking is so important. He should make up his mind that if he begins, he'll finish. And if he can't bring himself to agree within himself on this vital point, he probably shouldn't begin. As William James put it, it is our attitude at the beginning of a difficult undertaking which, more than anything else, will determine its successful outcome. When a person makes up his mind to do something, well, then it's only a matter of time. Staying with time takes bulldog persistence. This seems to be the entrance examination to success, lasting success of any kind. Like the man said, genius is only the power of making continuous efforts. There's something really sad about the person who spends his life running in circles, trying tentatively first this thing and that, expecting success to be a quick thing, and never staying with anything long enough to succeed. It doesn't take a genius to know that opportunities are all around us at all times. It comes down to what we see and how we react. It's a funny thing about human beings, but we all fail to see the forest for the trees. We go far afield for ideas while all the time our best ideas are all around us. Most new inventions, as a matter of fact, are made by men who are not engaged in the field in which the invention is made. Now, why couldn't the insiders see what the outsiders saw? They were looking too far afield instead of close to home. Suppose you start turning over stones close to home, seeking for ideas that are close to where you sit. They're the best ideas you can have, the easiest to put into use, the surest ideas in your life. One of my friends has been markedly successful in introducing new ideas, new methods into his business. If he overlooks any bets, I don't know what they are because he's always about a mile and a half ahead of everyone else in his industry. Well, I asked him how he did it, how he found the time to carry on this quest for new ideas while managing the affairs of an intricate business. And he told me about his practice, and it's one I should like to recommend to you. His practice is to set aside 15 minutes each evening for his imagination period. For years he's done this. Nine-tenths of the ideas that he's used in gaining the top position in his field have come during these imagination periods. During this 15-minute period, he merely sits alone and thinks, preferably in a darkened room so as to have no distractions of any kind. He lets his imagination roam over as wide a territory as it chooses for its peregrinations. He asks himself if he's overlooking any bets. If so, what are they? Is there anything new he should be introducing into his business, but isn't? Now, my friend is in a highly competitive business. I've heard his competitors complain, but I've never heard him complain. He apparently is always just a jump or two ahead of anybody in the same field. Try this same plan for a while yourself, no matter what you happen to do. It'll work just as well for running a well-managed home, a job, or anything else. I believe I can predict that after two or three weeks of getting your imagination used to the freedom you'll be giving it, you'll be flooded by ideas. You'll have more ideas than you probably thought yourself capable of having. A person who has never known the thrill and excitement of using his imagination to improve his lot is to be pitied. If he has used it to improve the lot of others, he has tasted his innate genius. Many who feel they are creative want to become a writer. Around the world, several million new books are published every year. Self-publishing and traditional publishing are loading up libraries and burning up gigabytes on devices. At the same time, book sales are declining. Search online for blogs, too, and you'll get over a half billion results. That's a billion with a B. Even with all that, becoming a writer is still a great career choice. Forget about the competition and learn what Earl advises on becoming a writer in our next episode. This is Earl Nightingale, and thank you.